In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time, and an era comes to an end. I am ceasing my activities in the post of President of the USSR. The tricolor banner of the Russian Republic now flies over the Kremlin. And from the White House, President Bush salutes the man who presided over the end of the Soviet Union. His legacy guarantees him an honored place in history and provides a solid basis for the United States to work in equally constructive ways with his successors. And tonight, Ted Koppel reports from Moscow about his extraordinary behind-the-scenes look at Mikhail Gorbachev's final hours in office. When Mikhail Gorbachev's face appeared on the TV set at Moscow's Belarusia train station tonight, some people looked up and listened. Some people deliberately did not. But most, it seemed, had their minds somewhere else, catching the train, getting dinner, getting home. The events that most of the world calls the end of an era, Gorbachev's resignation, and the last lowering of the Soviet flag that flew over the Kremlin dome were mourned by few of the people who had passed their lives under that flag. It is difficult to pinpoint when beneath these mammoth gates that Stalin built to last forever, leading to a park that celebrates all the Soviet Union would ever achieve in the fields of science and agriculture and engineering, the ticket taker did not even want to talk about Gorbachev today. Don't ask, she shouted, and then went on to curse the good-for-nothing foreigners bothering her with questions. Her colleague, who has worked this gate since 1957, was not so hot-headed, but she was against Gorbachev. Good that he resigned, she said. It's his fault that everything here has collapsed. What we heard over and over today from colleagues Gennady and Ivan from soldiers Kostya and Pasha, from close friends Valery and Luda, was that Gorbachev had done them some good a long time ago. Three years ago, says Valery, I'd have told you I liked him. He changed a lot in the world, Luda says, but not here. He hasn't done anything for us. But once people thought about it, they admitted that Gorbachev had opened their lives in many ways, that even if they may be afraid of running short of food or fuel this winter, they no longer are afraid of their government and its police. They can criticize their leaders, turn them into dolls if they want to. And that is mostly a good thing. Although today the street sellers complained that the Gorbachev model isn't selling as well as it used to. Thanks to Gorbachev, Moscow bookstores have real current event sections and political science departments, where it turns out Gorbachev's writings remain on sale and according to this saleswoman, still sell well. But Gorbachev was always popular with his country's more educated people the playwrights and the novelists, whom he rescued from censorship. I wouldn't say that he's very popular. On the contrary, he's completely unpopular. But at the same time, I think that in 5, 10, 20 years, he will be um, greeted as uh, Peter the Great or Alexander the Second. I mean, the best Russian Tsars. It was not only in the libraries of intellectuals that we found such sentiment. This man on the cigarette line said, democracy did not start with Yeltsin. It started with Gorbachev. If there had not been a Gorbachev, there would never have been a Yeltsin. The nuclear button is now already with Yeltsin. Yeltsin, who from today not only heads Russia, but also controls all of the old Soviet Union's arsenal of nuclear missiles, and whose team has to weigh the meaning of a Gorbachev out of power. It uh, looks like uh, he plans to be in opposition. Uh, we were opposition to him, and uh, he now plans. That this is my feeling. Tonight he signed away his power, and without it, it may be that Gorbachev will never again walk with footsteps that shake the globe. But today, even people opposed to Gorbachev declared that he had earned his place in history. On this night, when they raised the flag of Russia over the Kremlin, one woman said of Gorbachev, I will never forget his years in power. They were the best and the worst of my life. John the day's historic events brought President Bush a Christmas present he could not have imagined even weeks ago. In fact, he found them so compelling, he returned to the White House just long enough to address the American people and tell them their most formidable enemy no longer exists. The Soviet Union itself is no more. 
This is a victory for democracy and freedom. I'd like to express on behalf of the American people my gratitude to Mikhail Gorbachev for years of sustained commitment to world peace and for his intellect, vision, and courage. President Bush turned to the political reality ahead, granting formal diplomatic recognition to the largest republic which will fill much of the void left by Gorbachev and the old Soviet government. The United States recognizes and welcomes the emergence of a free, independent, and democratic Russia led by its courageous president, Boris Yeltsin. Our embassy in Moscow will remain there as our embassy to Russia. We will support Russia's assumption of the USSR's seat as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. President Bush then abandoned the word Soviet and spoke of helping the new Commonwealth of Independent States. But he clearly knew he will find very limited patience at home for spending abroad. These dramatic events come at a time when Americans are also facing challenges here at home. I know that for many of you, these are difficult times. And I want all Americans to know that I'm committed to attacking our economic problems at home with the same determination we brought to winning the Cold War. Gorbachev spends his final days at the Kremlin.